That's what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. All right, so um, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out so early. I certainly wouldn't be here if I didn't have to be. Um, and uh, this is, we're going to be giving some lightning talks about um, augmented reality authoring and um, just sort of the state of the art right now and what we're working on in Unity Labs. So myself, I'm Matt Schoen. I'm an engineer at Unity Labs, I'm specializing in XR. Um, following me is going to be Stella. We have Jono and Andrew in the back who are going to be giving the rest of the uh, presentations this morning. And I'm going to be focusing today on XR cameras. So first of all, um, when I talk about an XR camera, what makes it a special thing is that we have a virtual camera with real world input. So here we have some different um, devices that you might be familiar with or you might not be. Um, we have an Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, Microsoft HoloLens, some Microsoft Windows Mixed Reality um, devices, and then a smartphone with augmented reality capabilities. Um, so all of these things are giving us a view into a virtual scene using some real world object to track the position and, position and or rotation of the camera. So when I talk about that tracking, it's talk, we call it six DOF or six degree of freedom tracking. Um, and it consists of position tracking and orientation tracking. Some devices will only give you orientation, such as a Gear VR or a cardboard. Um, but most of the time when we talk about XR, we're talking about full six degree of freedom tracking. Um, there's also some physical, physical characteristics of the device that you're going to have to virtualize, which are the IPD and FOV. FOV is the field of view, which you can see represented here by this camera frustum. Um, the field of view is a angular um, metric that determines the range of view of the camera, um, which in virtual reality, you want to match that up so that the eye sees what the screen is displaying. And in augmented reality, you want the, the camera feed to match up with the virtual content so that if I put a virtual object on this table here, it's not going to sort of appear to be off the edge of the table or something like that, depending upon the camera distortion. So um, the first kind of issue that we have to tackle when dealing with this virtual to real world mapping is the concept of scale. So you might want to have your game at sort of like regular old scale like we're doing here, where you have a one to one mapping of virtual to real. But odds are, you're, if it's a fantastical thing, you might be out in space where you have like a universal scale, maybe a um, solar system type scale, which is like a shrinking down of the order of magnitude. And then in here, we start to get to like, planet from above or planetary size. Um, and as an aside, these are the scales that we can, we can kind of play around with in Editor XR. So we have our 1,000 to 1, 100 to 1, 10 to 1 scales. Then we get down to like a room scale, which is what I'm describing as like more of a 1 to 1, where things are represented in virtual as they are in real world, a meter is a meter. And then you can even go deeper and go into sort of like the molecular or the um, atomic scale. And we're sort of fitting that in, in Editor XR, at least, by saying, well, sure, like, you can go down to a tenth of the size, and maybe you're like the size of a burrito, and then a hundredth of the size. We represent it with an atom, but obviously atoms are way, way, way smaller. Um, so how do we deal with all these different uh, levels of scale? I don't have time to show you this whole video, but if you're familiar with um, this, I think it's from like the 70s, this uh, Powers of 10 video that's just sort of like trying to get people to wrap their head around. This, this changing in order of magnitude. You start out with a person size, you zoom out, you zoom out, and you can see sort of represented here like what 10 to the one meters looks like, uh, 10 to the two, people had a lot more time in the 70s. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this is what we're dealing with, right? We're trying to represent all these different levels of order of magnitude in the same kind of seamless environment. You can even see in this video here, they have to sort of cross fade between different shots, right? Because you couldn't take one camera, they didn't have drones back then or anything, you couldn't take one camera and just shoot it straight up in the air. Um, so moving right along, in 3D, or sorry, in, in virtual worlds, we represent uh, positions and, and values with floating point numbers. So what are floating point numbers? Well, uh, first of all, does anyone here want to like take a deep dive on floating points at 9.30 in the morning? Probably not. Okay. So like, if you get it, you get it. If you don't, basically what's going on is that we have this value in binary that we can represent with a decimal point that floats around depending upon how big or small the number is. So if we have a really, really big value of number, there we have like you know, no significant dis dis digits in the decimal point, you know, 65 million and no decimals, or we can have like 65 millionths of a unit and that's also represented with this number. Here I have graphed out for you like what the different floating point numbers can represent. Uh, so like each, each value on the x-axis here is a step forward, like each the next, the next number we can represent. And all that you really meant to see here is that the, the, the green line is showing you the distance, the difference between these steps, 
And it gets really big as we get bigger numbers, and it gets smaller as we get to smaller numbers. And it's still, as you get nearer and nearer to zero, we still have these stepping down, stepping down of precision, where the smallest dis difference between a number we can make is very large for a very large number, is very small for a very small number. So what does it look like in a game engine? Well, if we try to make a solar system, I don't know if you guys made like a solar system model in school when you were younger, but this is sort of one of the uh, naive thing you'd want to say like, oh, cool, I'm going to go into a game engine and I want to be able to fly around and see all the planets and stuff. Well, it turns out that at actual scales, you just can't represent things in a game engine. If you try to put 1.49 uh, million kilometers, uh, or 149 million kilometers, Unity's going to tell you, due to floating point precision limitations, it's recommended that you bring this to smaller range from zero. So, okay, that's fine. We can just divide by things. Let's say we have 100 million meters to one meter scale. Well, our Earth is now, point tw is now uh, 12 centimeters in scale. Our sun is 13 meters wide still. And if we put the camera right on the top of the Earth, that's your little sun right there. Whoops. So the, the, the moral of the story here is like, if you want to make the solar system, you're not really going to make it to scale if you want it to actually be like visible and, and sort of significant to the, to the viewer. The reason we can see the sun is because it's a light source and it makes a halo as it goes through the atmosphere and all that. If we were to actually look at the sun, it would be just about that big. Um, also, I'm highlighting here that we run into these certain parts of the Unity editor that will just not let us make values get any smaller. So you can programmatically set your camera matrix to have a near plane that's less than one centimeter, but the, like, the field in the editor restricts you to making that one centimeter and above. Again, due to these floating point precision things, but basically you're not meant to make like, anything closer than 0 0.01 units to the camera. If you do want to do that, the, there are other solutions. Here are some other places that you're going to run to scale limitations. Uh, nav mesh agents can have a radius that's smaller than five centimeters. So this here is like a little hack week project that we did trying to do lemmings in AR. So our lemmings were like little like two or three centimeter tall characters, which means that their radius has got to be really small, which means that we can't have that limitation um, affect us. Same thing happens in lighting. You can make a really small cube and do light maps and do things on it, but you've got to like change all the values and, and it just becomes a, a mess. Same thing with physics. Uh, you can actually, like, I, I was thinking that one of these would be a limitation where like, physics just wouldn't work at these small scales, but you can actually modify all these values. You just get these absurdly small, like, contact offsets, and gravity is now, like, an unrecognizably small number. So all this seems like a total mess. There's probably other systems that I wasn't able to look into that will break down. There's a better solution out there. All right, here's one more example of, even if we do have our, our tiny little solar, solar system, when you put Pluto out, in its, in its uh, orbit, you start to get these weird kind of, this should be a sphere, but it's actually kind of a jaggy line. Um, so hey, here's your, here's your solar system. That works just fine. Uh, so let's look at some other ways that floating precision will break down. This is what happens in Editor XR if you remove the limitations on how much you can scale the camera. And I've gone like way far out away from the origin. If I scale myself up really big, my, my UI is now readable because the actual size of it is like 100 meters wide. But if I go back down to having like a, a meter per, per object, I kind of get this weird like quantum soup <laughs> and everything, everything falls apart. Uh, the same thing will happen if you um, scale yourself down near the origin. So you can see here we reduce the draw distance sort of to keep things proportional as you scale yourself smaller and smaller and smaller. And then at a certain point, things break and the, the UVs don't work anymore in that text. Um, you get all these errors in the console. And uh, you can also see in a second, I'm going to sort of like point the controller at the UI. Um, and the RAID is like poked straight through. The interactions don't work anymore. These are all the things that will break down if we don't limit this uh, ability to scale smaller and smaller and get these precision issues. So how do we fix all of this? There must be a better way. Well, we scale the parent of the camera. That lets us have a large scene represented as a small scene uh, without actually making the units of the, um, of the objects smaller. So here we have like a city scene where I have these buildings. They're like 30, 30 feet tall. These cars are sort of to scale if this character is a you know, normal-sized human. And as I move this smaller smartphone around the, the, the table, this like virtual table is sort of representing the real table, I have another view out here of this um, other, this other representation of the scene is scaled up 100 times, and the, the phone motion is matching, but at a larger scale. So we have this, um, let me sorry, let me get back to the place where that's happening. 
All right, I guess I just have to let it play out. But yeah, as this little phone moves around, you'll see that its motion is directly matched out here, but scaled up 100 times so that we're the, it's as, it's as if we're like Godzilla, 100 times our normal size, looking down on this tiny city. And then we get to have all of the city scene have the, the normal scale that it normally does. We don't have to mess with the physics. We don't have to mess with the lighting parameters. It's all just normal size. So we, then we get to say, if we want to do a solar system, again, it's, it's normal size, and we can get our, our character to be even bigger and work within that reasonable range of like 0.01 to 1,000 times of, of the normal scale. So uh, in code, it's actually pretty simple to apply this offset to things. So if we have um, a camera that has a position, a scale, and a uh, rotation offset, you'll notice I'm only using the yaw offset because it doesn't really make sense if I'm going to rotate my camera parent like roll that I wouldn't want like the horizon of the scene to rotate. So when we're talking about XR, we still have a kind of grounded gravity is down or there is a down direction, and I don't want to like be able to skew the camera so that my eyes are on top of each other and I'm looking like this. Um, so we rotate based on the camera parent's yaw, its scale, and then we can get a position and rotation for this um, extrapolated uh, camera or content, depending upon what we're, what we're trying to do here. So what else can we do with this, with this moving the camera parent around? Well, we can offset things. Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to move the camera instead of just scaling it? Well, we have this problem of relocalization. So we have either maybe it's two AR devices or one AR and one VR device, two tracked cameras, and we want to be able to represent the content that they're seeing in the same space. So we want to make sure that their origins are the same, their forward directions are the same, all these things match up, and it lets us do this kind of cool effect of like a view into, either a view into VR or a view into someone else's AR. So we have these two cameras that are looking at the same physical table, but from two different directions, and we want to make sure that their scene lines up. In practice, what happens is that uh, user A localizes the scene, sees the table short end on, and then their, their camera forward direction has the scene place, facing that way. User B sees the table long end on, and they still have their forward direction facing relative to them forward. So their scenes won't match up, because if you can see here, the table has sort of been rotated. This, virtual, this real table is in the same orientation relative to the world, but relative to how they started calibrating the world, it's rotated 90 degrees off. So the solution is that you have to localize B to this position in A's world, and you do that by just moving that camera parent and rotating it, and then that, like, you have to then sort of apply, apply the inverse of that rotation to the content in order for it to show up in the right spot. Um, how do you know where B is with relation to A? We're still sort of trying to figure out that problem. Um, one easy way, to, or easy way to do it is to use a AR marker on the table that you have a known rotation for, and that is now something that is a kind of ground truth between the two. Um, in the previous example, we used like, the position of the controller and the position of the um, HMD as known positions that we could use as, a, um, uh, as an offset. So that was kind of a complicated thing to get your head around, but like if you've done AR multiplayer, it's a very real problem. Um, another thing we can do by offsetting the camera, I want to be cognizant of time here too. Um, sorry, I keep skipping around. Yeah, so uh, in Editor XR and, and sort of VR in general, it makes a lot more sense just to have this virtual locomotion because we're in a purely virtual scene. So what you're seeing here is me um, using the controllers and the controls in Editor XR to move my avatar around. I can still move my head and look around within the camera parent that's moving around, that, that's mo moving me and scaling me, but I can also now sort of like uh, d do this sort of rotation and scale stuff, and that's, this is what it looks like kind of from a third person perspective. Um, but what's actually happening here is that I'm, you, when I fly around, I'm taking some, some offset and moving the camera side to side, or moving the camera parent side to side, sorry. What else can we do? Uh, there's this sort of concept of having things in my local space versus the world space. So if things are a child of the parent, of the camera parent with the camera, they will move with the camera and they will appear to be fixed when I virtually locomote. So what I'm first doing here is I made some primitives in the scene. Now I'm opening a workspace and in EditorXR the workspaces are, are children of the camera parent. And you see they both respect my head movement. Only the scene respects the locomotion and when I locomote myself, the workspace stays fixed. So we have these workspaces in local space, the scene is the world space, and then my, I can move my head side to side, and that is separate from, from both local and world. 
And then finally, we have this cool mini world feature in Editor XR where um, we take this, the tracked virtual camera, and then we, we apply a different, um, a different view matrix to, like, to the track position that you're getting. So I can still move my head and rotate it around the mini world, but it's rendering some other scene at a different scale and rotation remote to me. Um, but it's also still a tracked camera. It's not like a fixed sort of overlay. Um, so these are sort of the various things that we've been doing with cameras in XR and Unity. And that's my time. We don't have time for Q&A right now, but thanks for your time. And let's kick it over to Stella. Uh, yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Stella Canfax. I'm an engineer here with Labs. And my talk is called Recording and Simulation for Mixed Reality Authoring. But it's really about uh, having empathy for your device's limited understanding of the world. So how do we as humans know the world? We know the world through our five senses, touch, sight, taste, blah, blah, blah. How do devices know the world? And how devices know the world changes a lot from device to device. So for instance, this here is a HoloLens' understanding of the world. You can see it's gone ahead and labeled the floor here and meshed out the environment. Here is my phone's understanding of the world. It's got some feature points. It's got an RGB video. Um, and here is, for example, the Berkeley Deep Drive Project's view of the world, which understands the world through LiDAR and things like that. So how our devices understand the world can vary a lot. And it's generally very limited, because devices don't have the context that we get from our whole entire lives. They don't get to learn for a long period of time and have this huge wealth of knowledge that means physical situations are intuitive. So that means that uh, you can think about most devices as having been born like a year or two ago, because they were. Uh, so how can we bridge this gap, and how can we, as humans, better understand uh, what our devices understand and what data they're working with? Uh, and could we make learning about that fun, physical, real? So uh, we did some experiments to answer these questions with capturing AR data from a device and revisualizing re it in the editor. And we chose to do this for a few different reasons. Um, number one being that uh, recontextualizing it, uh, removing the data from the experience of creating the data and from the sort of native view that you have when you're walking around with your phone, changes how you feel about it and makes it more analyzable. So here's some footage from that project. Uh, so what you see here is a uh, revisualized uh, capture of me moving my phone around my apartment and recording the underlying surfaces and feature points that AR Core was giving me. Uh, and these blue dots are the feature points over time uh, of me walking around. And the lines are surfaces. So uh, just seeing this immediately was intuitive for me because I started seeing patterns uh, that emerge from looking at it over time that you can't see when you are just looking at your feature points on device. Uh, let me skip around. So here, uh, you can see the structure of my apartment start to emerge. You can see uh, the lines of walls and everything. And there's one particular phenomenon you start to see, which is these lines that form everywhere. Uh, and I've taken to calling these uh, feature trails. If I can ever skip to the next slide. Cool. And so this GIF right here uh, shows you exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, as I move backwards and forwards, you see these like straight lines of feature points that are report reported from the phone. And what causes these is a mixture of natural user motion, which is like translating your phone, rotating your phone, uh, which causes natural arts, as well as uh, AR Core Kit understand, updating its understanding of the world. So even if you stand pretty still and you move just a little bit, sometimes you will see these feature points update themselves. Uh, and that's just the phone changing its guess, really. 
And so those are still of the streaks from the top-down perspective, like I showed earlier. So not only uh, from like a space perspective, but even from a top-down perspective, these sort of patterns emerge. Uh, and my main takeaway from that example is that the point clouds you get from current AR platforms are provided on a per-frame basis, but you can learn a lot more about what the phone knows about the world by considering them over a period of time. And so uh, we have some ideas about where we'd like to take this sort of basic concept in the future. And uh, the big leap forward we're looking for is semantic understanding of the world that's native to devices. So instead of just this device understands just what the floor is or this device just understands what feature points are, uh, instead we look forward to devices that sort of have this understanding where they can segment the scene uh, in a meaningful way. And so now I want to kind of flip this around and talk about the flip side of this coin, which is how simulation can also help us in this regard. So it's, it's really hard to test your AR app in all the different settings you can run it. It's basically impossible, actually. Uh, you're not welcome in all the different spaces, uh, and there's a literally infinite variety of spaces that you can go to. So in order to make testing those things possible and make the developer experience better, we can simulate those things. Uh, and in its basic form right now, uh, all we're doing is faking the hardware data that phones expect. So this is a shot from our experimental AR interface repo where we just uh, fake plane and point data in the editor so that apps can run without hardware contacts. But in the future, we want to generate a huge variety of spaces. So we want to be able to say, how well will my AR app play out in the average one-bedroom apartment in this country, how well would it play out in a park? Um, can you give me an example of an office? Uh, and generate procedurally, or just draw from a library, semantic spaces with uh, tracking data built in, so you can not only understand, but watch how your app might play out. So in conclusion, um, the possibility space for mixed reality is infinite. And we need to develop new authoring concepts and new understandings about how to deal with uncertainty and how to deal with limited world understanding. Uh, and I, I refer to that as having empathy for your device's limited knowledge. And that's it. And next up is Jono. It's going to be great. Good morning. Get on the right slides here. Hi, I'm Jono. Uh, I also work in labs with these fine folks you've heard from so far. Uh, and there I am, a UX engineer, and I'm going to be talking about uh, what Stella was just starting to get into, which is semantics in AR, semantic labeling, to use the kind of academic term. Uh, and I'll really draw out what that means going through uh, three particular use cases that I think are helpful to think about. Uh, so the first case is sort of a canonical one that we, that we throw around sometimes, which is a, a character walks through a door. Uh, and the idea here being we're in a real space, like the space we're in right now. We're in the Unity Atrium. I have a door over there. Uh, I have some chairs over here. I want to make an app where a virtual character is going to walk through my real door, find its way through the room, and sit down in an open chair. Uh, and the thing about that, of course, I'm talking about real spaces. So that might be the Unity Atrium here. It might be my apartment be upstairs, might be somewhere else. So the first question you have to ask is, OK, what is a door, right? Your system actually needs to understand what it's looking at and how to process that information. Uh, as Stella was just saying, semantic labeling is sort of the, the solution here, uh, segmentation and semantics. So AR platforms can't exactly do this right now. But here is uh, some research from last year showing just from this single image in the upper left, uh, these researchers are able to point out, OK, this is a floor, this is a bed, this is some other furniture, here's some wall art. Uh, so that's, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, is being able to look at a scene and really know what's in it, as opposed to just saying, here are some planes, maybe here are some vertical planes. You know, this is the kind of thing that, that is going to become really important as we start building air apps that are actually aware of the world they exist in. OK, so we have a door. Say so we have, have such a system. We have, we have an AR platform that can identify doors and, and such. What do we do with that information? 
Uh, so one thing is, you know, we're still in the editor here, right? We're still working in Unity, uh, and we need some way of actually representing real objects, you know, not virtual scene objects, but actual real life objects in the editor to work around. So we're gonna have to have some sort of concept here about, uh, you know, what, what does a door look like, and it could be any door, it could match any door you see, uh, but how do you actually work with that information in a scene that you're building? And all these objects, uh, these things that we're seeing in the scene, these are objects that really are composed of these, these uh, core concepts of different traits and conditions that we describe them by. So a door, for example, I can say, okay, when I, when I see a vertical plane and something that the system has marked as a egress, like an entrance and exit into a space, and maybe I have some advanced information about like this is a thing that can, that can open on a hinge, or maybe somehow I know that it can lock, right? Maybe you could pick that up from the semantic view of the world then I'll call that a door. And similarly for a chair, maybe I say a chair is, okay, it's a horizontal surface, and it's something I can sit on. Okay, so this is out because it's too high. And something that can move, uh, again, maybe it's something you can pick up from the uh, semantic system inside. And of course, all these traits are defined themselves by other traits. So I say sittable is, like I said here, like it's a certain elevation off the ground, and it's also the size of the thing, and it also has some empty space in front of it for my legs to be. So you can kind of think about each of these traits and how you can break that down into these really granular uh, descriptions. In this app, what I really care about is these two specific factors. Is a egress to a space and is a sittable surface? Uh, because you know, maybe it's not actually a door, maybe it's an archway, maybe it's a just gap in the wall, I don't know. Uh, and I still want my character to be able to deal with that. So we have to start thinking about these like conceptual definitions of spaces as opposed to really specific narrow definitions. Okay, but what if I don't have a door, right? I'm running this app in whatever space I'm in, and maybe there is no door, maybe there's no chair, maybe I'm in the middle of a big field. Uh, now what? So we just start thinking about fallbacks of like, if you're building an AR app that has this really narrow definition, how does it handle the world that doesn't fit your narrow definition? And there's also an element of time here of maybe there's no door that you found yet, because <laughs> we can imagine this kind of perfect AR system that immediately slams the whole world and knows where everything is and what to call it. Uh, but as it is, no such system exists, right? If you start up a, you know, a phone-based AR app right now, you start with nothing. And you scan for a few seconds, and you start to get some planes, and you start to get some, some more points, and maybe you can start building up uh, some understanding of the space over time, but you're not gonna know right away what's what. So there's some element of trying to, you know, having to wait for the system to be able to figure out what's what, uh, and there's also some element of like, all right, we haven't found a door in 10 seconds, maybe we should move on to the no door scenario. Things to think about. Okay, another use case I think is, is helpful to think about for these kind of future AR apps that we're gonna wanna build is instead of that really narrow definition, what about just like, I've been playing a lot of some RPG lately and I really want to see my entire world filled out in that world's style. Maybe I can climb up vertical surfaces and paraglide off of them and go find some shrines, right? It would be cool. Uh, so the first step, I think, to build that kind of app would be just sort of basic rules. How do we start? So maybe I say I find the floor, and Andrew will talk about that. It's more complicated than it sounds, but say I can find the floor, uh, and I just say wherever the floor is, just put water on it, and that's my base, my base case. So my character can swim up to a certain point. And then if I find some other horizontal surfaces, make those grass. You know, I have a prefab for some grass, throw it on there. And I find that vertical surface I was talking about, make that a cliff that my character can climb. And from that, just right away, I'd look around this room and immediately get water down here and get grass on the stage here and a cliff side, hey Timothy, and a cliff side on the wall, it'd be great. Uh, and then from, from that, you could think about building out these increasingly specific scenarios that you get into. So maybe I say, if I find two surfaces near each other, uh, here and here, sure. If I find this table and the stage, then maybe I can make a bridge between those surfaces. Uh, if I find some really hard to reach spot, I don't know, on top of that speaker over there, uh, then I should stick some you know, goal there, some treasure chest, some nice thing to find. And then maybe I have some really specific semantic thing that I want to set up of, okay, if I'm in my apartment and I find a stove, then that would be a cool place to put a lava temple, or maybe it's a fridge, I put an ice temple. So you could think about kind of building up these more and more and more specific situations. Maybe think of them as Easter eggs, maybe think of them as, you know, nice-to-haves in your, in your app. And one thing about the uh, 
you know, just create a bridge between them. Anybody who's been building uh, parametric modeling-based apps or procedural content in your games, like you have a big head start into this world. I think those topics are gonna be increasingly important as we start thinking about like how to skin the whole world. You have to think very procedurally about that. In a lot of ways, this example is like the exact opposite of the first example I gave, right? Because in the avatar walks through a door scenario, you're talking about this really specific definition of like, if I find this certain case, then I know exactly what I wanna do with that and I can run this app against it. Uh, and, then, and then maybe I can fall back from there and try to gracefully degrade that experience. As opposed to this, this example, the game my life layer, uh, in that case I'm just saying whatever I see, just throw this imaginary RPG on top of it, uh, and then can build up from there instead. Uh, so I think you gotta, you gotta think about which way you're, you're designing content when you talk about these kinds of apps. And the thing is there, there is a time and a place for both of them because probably in the short term, like in the next, uh, I won't give any time frames, but soon, uh, you're gonna wanna do the, the second one. You're gonna do just, okay, whatever I see, let's, let's style it, let's layer it, let's do some cool stuff with it. Uh, and then I think as AR becomes more and more advanced and semantically aware and more commonplace, uh, we'll probably have these more and more narrow definition apps that fit some specific situation in your, in your day. So to that end, uh, the third use case I'll run through is a, how do, I, how do I food, how do I cook in the modern AR age? Uh, and that's a really specific use case of like, this is a recipe helper of, you know, help me make dinner tonight. And I think that gets us into one more interesting idea, which is the idea that you can separate out what the app wants you to do from the way that your system is actually going to interpret that and show that to you. Uh, and I think that this is really important in AR in a way that it hasn't been before because it is so much a part of your reality that I think it's really important to think about how we can personalize this and make apps that like, feel right to the, to the user. Uh, so for an example here, in this, in this cooking app, I, okay, I'm gonna cut some veggies up and saute them. You know, simple, simple cooking app. Uh, and then those, those are the goals that my, that my app is gonna surface up to the system. And then maybe my system is gonna interpret this as, you know, maybe I want traditional UI of like, here's some thing I'm gonna cook and I want an arrow pointing at it. It's like this, grab this and cook this thing. Uh, and maybe I want to present that in different ways. Like maybe I'm really into Blade Runner and I want that to be like bright, flashy, neon, crazy future AR stuff, right? But maybe you're more into chill walks in the woods and you want to present this more like natural tones and have some like wood looking UI. You know, not all AR has to be this like aggressive uh, dystopian look. Uh, or maybe I'm the kind of person who learns best by somebody showing it to me. So maybe I want to see that, you know, that first example, the avatar comes into the room and is like, all right, here's how you saute veggies. Uh, because that's probably gonna work a lot better for some people. Or maybe I wanna like trick my hypothetical children into cooking dinner and I take that second example and say lay that on top of what I want them to do of like, all right, I have my little character who I'm gonna you know, pop onto this food and then the goal is to take them over to the stove to solve the puzzle, right? And these are all like valid ways to present the same app, the same goals. And again, I think that it's, it's important to think about this, this separation because like I said, you know, it's, it's, very, it's a very like, personal experience, a very reality-altering experience, so we should think about how people can personalize. So yeah, there's a lot of work between where we are now and this, these future apps I'm describing. But I think there's not a lot of time. I think that this is all very, very close at hand. Uh, yeah, I showed that piece of research at the beginning that, that shows the semantic uh, labeling the segmentation, the scene. You know, this is all real stuff right now that, that exists, it just doesn't all exist in one place yet. Uh, so I think that, you know, that'll all be aggregated very, very soon. Or if, if you had the, you know, guts to go jump into some research papers, you, you could actually build this kind of thing currently. So just a little bit of a preview of what, what's ahead of us. Uh, so for one thing, AR platforms, you know, the people actually making the devices and making the, the systems. Uh, we need this segmentation of the room. We need the semantic labeling of objects in order to do any of this stuff. On sort of a totally different wavelength, um, there are really weird ethical conversations that have to happen here. You know, this is totally outside the scope of this talk, but uh, I think it's something that needs to just be addressed whenever we talk about this stuff. Like, okay, what are we augmenting? And what are we encouraging people to change about their perception of reality? So much more to talk about there someday, soon. And then for all of us, uh, for you know, those of us building Unity and for those of you in the audience building apps, building the actual things we're talking about here, uh, 
you know, we've, we've had this long legacy of building like very discrete virtual worlds where you're really in control of the whole experience. And now we're moving into this different phase where you know, the real world is the canvas and you don't have any control over that. And you just gotta deal with wherever somebody is and figure out how to make that into the experience that, that you're trying to present to the user. Uh, so that means a lot of you know, thinking conceptually and thinking in terms of degrees of certainty about the world as opposed to knowing exactly what it is you're building, which is a very weird space. So in conclusion, uh, the future's gonna be weird. Let's build it. Thanks. I'm a perceptual engineer at Unity Labs, and I'm going to be talking about something that is the kind of intersection of perception and decision. Uh, it's reasoning in AR, uh, and reasoning with AR. Now, this seems like a deceptively simple problem pretty much all the time, uh, so simple that it could be a children's story. So I've made a children's story. So uh, this story is called What is the Floor? And in a Far off land, there's a creature known as the AR cricket. And what makes it so special is that it sees the world as a series of planes. Now, it had something it really wanted to know. It had heard about something called a floor, but it didn't quite know what it was. So the cricket went to the wisest elders of the land and brought his question to them. The elders knew how the cricket saw the world. Uh, so the first elder went and answered the question, and he said, the floor is just a plane. Well, the cricket was very excited because it realized it was standing on the floor, but it wasn't actually standing on the floor. So the elder corrected himself and said, no, no, it's the lowest plane. And it turns out if you only have one plane, it is also the lowest plane. So the elder corrected himself again and again, and once they got to about three planes, the cricket could generally find the floor. But then the cricket saw a staircase, and the stair was made of multiple floors, each lower than the last, and the floor just moved away from it. So then the elder and the cricket had a long conversation about the possibility of having more than one floor and coming up with a heuristic based on having multiple planes and coming up with a room size based on these relationships. And the cricket was feeling less and less confident in this question. So the next elder decided to go and help out with the problem. Uh, her name was Cloud for her white coat and great speed. Uh, so the cricket hopped on her back, and they raced off across the entire land. And they mapped out the entire land, all the planes that the cricket saw. Whenever it saw a plane, the cloud went and said whether it was a floor or not. And soon, everything was known. Except when they got back, it turned out not everything was known, because as soon as something changed, the map was out of date. So the third elder decided to help. This is the elder known as machine learning. So once again, the cricket soared over the land. Now this elder didn't teach the cricket uh, rules or just give it data. Uh, he taught the cricket to consider all the data and make choices for itself. But it turned out that not everyone agrees with the choices the cricket makes. The cricket thought that this uh, pl uh, plank over a cliff was a very good floor and not everyone agreed with that. So as the elders began to argue, the cricket felt a wave of relief, because while it wasn't quite sure what a floor was, apparently no one else was either. So, yeah, not done yet. <laughs> Let me get my nose over here. Yeah, so, this is one of the common challenges of AR. It's defining the world through an imperfect lens, and I would say that this is the primary challenge of AR. Uh, and it's a good one. It's uh, part puzzle, part coming up with intuition for the world. Uh, and there's going to be new technologies and new techniques and all sorts of cool stuff coming along the way, and they're all going to fail. Uh, but you should still try to solve this problem, and you must try to solve this problem. Uh, just don't break your back getting it perfect, and here's why. Reality is subjective. And uh, once again, for emphasis, reality is subjective. Uh, so it's subject to imperfect data. We just went over that. It's also subject to context. So how many apples do you see up here? Uh, some people might say three, and that's a valid answer. And some of you might say, well, really you mean apple to fruit. Okay, there's two. 
And someone else might say, ah, but you can't eat a cartoon. All right, so one apple. And then someone else might say, ah, but you also can't eat a photograph. And that is also true. So any number between zero and three is valid. That is the power of context. Uh, and this isn't a new problem. Pe as, pretty much as long as we've had symbols, scientists and philosophers have been considering this. Uh, this is a pretty famous example. Uh, it's a painting called The Treachery of Images. The text says, this is not a pipe. And in fact, this isn't even the painting, The Treachery of Images. It's a picture of the painting, The Treachery of Images. Uh, so even if we decided to not be extremely literal about this and said, like, okay, uh, we want a physical apple that a human can eat. It's healthy for them. It's the kind you get at a grocery store. Which apples should your AR device highlight? Should it highlight only apples that you own? Should it highlight apples that you can afford? Should it highlight apples that are behind a locked glass case? Every time you think you have this problem solved, there is more context still. Uh, and when you start getting into gesture and expression recognition, there is even more context. Uh, now you have to worry about how different uh, cultures go and have different expressions and gestures. So you have to know about your upbringing, what country you're in, and the country and upbringing of the person you're looking at. Now, this also happens with navigation. Uh, should your navigation route highlight uh, routes with lots of stairs or hills if your user is elderly or disabled, or they're not wearing good shoes for the path, or maybe they don't even feel like just taking that route today? Uh, and that brings us to the next problem. Reality is subject to opinion. So we can even say that, yes, we have the perfect AR device, and there's a human manually feeding the data in, so they're getting things relatively human correct. We still have the problem that people are just going to flat out disagree on things. Uh, so I'm sure you're uh, familiar with this picture. It's a common question of, is this dress uh, black and blue or white and gold? Now, there is a scientific answer to this question, but the real question is what color does the user perceive? Uh, and how can we possibly know that? Uh, it turns out that about half the country has one answer, half the country has the other. That should be a pretty familiar uh, number with a lot of people not these days. Uh, and this is also not a problem we can ignore. Uh, pretty much all of our arts use these kind of perceptual hacks uh, to their advantage. So things like warm and cold colors, white noise and blue noise, uh, any kind of trick to convey weight and animation. Uh, if we use it, we also have to recognize it. Uh, so how do we begin to flat out, uh, how do we begin to account for things that people flat out disagree with? Well, I have a system of uh, kind of guidelines, uh, reasoning for reasoning. So the first thing is always uh, keep your users safe. Uh, you might think, oh, well, these are AR glasses. People know what's real and what's not. Uh, and I would counter with that people have driven their cars into lakes following their GPS. This has actually happened. It's not just a skit from the office. Uh, second, make the user happy. Uh, if the user sees something in their technology that they disagree with, do you think they are going to change their mind? Or are they going to think that your technology is broken or biased? And if they think that, are they going to tell all your friends, uh, all their friends, hey, this thing sucks? Uh, and a lot of times this is just a matter of rewording things that uh, have the same general meaning. Uh, and this is a pretty common problem. Even among my own team, we'll have very heated debates about uh, how we want to implement something. And it turns out we all wanted the same general solution in the end. We just had slightly different ways of wording it. Uh, the last one is a networking concept. Uh, so when you're networking games, you only share what is absolutely necessary to get the simulation in sync. So anything like particle systems and stuff are all done locally. Uh, and that should go, uh, that should happen also here for reasoning with AR. Uh, anything you have to reason with that you don't have to share between other users, you shouldn't. The problems I've been describing right now are to, uh, make one user and one device happy, and when you start sharing things, then it's two users and two devices, or three users and three devices, or 10 users and 10 devices, and the problem gets way more complex. Uh, just stay out of that conversation. If two users disagree on something, they're still gonna disagree on it if their AR devices are kind of in interjecting themselves in the conversation. Uh, keep your problem space simple. Yeah, so uh, thank you and good luck. Uh, and we have some time for questions, I think.